In this video, we will discuss a third type of simple machine called Wheel in Excel. We've seen before that in an internal combustion engine, the to and fro motion of the piston is transferred to a rotary motion of the crank, which in turn through a set of gears and powertrain transfer the rotary motion to the rotary motion of the wheels. And to do that, you would typically have an Excel that would connect to the wheels. So, so wheels and Excels, of course, you can see them in all kinds of automobiles uh, all the time. So let's say the motion being transferred is from the Excel to the wheel. Okay, so in this case, here's the rotation of the Excel, and then you have corresponding rotation of the wheel. Okay, and clearly both of them are going to rotate with the same angular speed because they're part of the same you know, rigid body. There's no relative rotation between the axle and the wheel. So in this case, what are we gaining on and what are we losing on, right? Because one of the underlying themes with all the simple machines is that either you have a force advantage or a torque advantage or an angular speed advantage or a linear speed advantage. So previously in pulleys, as well as in case of lever, we have seen that we either have a force advantage or a, a torque advantage or a speed advantage. So let's see what happens in this case. So first of all, we know that the torque applied uh, uh, on the input shaft on the axle would be same as the torque on the output, which is the wheel in this case. So the torque and the omega are same. And that makes sense because we know that the input power should be equal to the output power. And that is equal to nothing but torque times omega. Okay. All right. Now let's look at uh, the Excel itself. Uh, so if you look at the Excel, you know, I'm, I'm going to draw it a little bit you know, bigger. This is my Excel, right? Just a part of it. Let's say the radius or the diameter of this is D1, okay? If this is rotating with angular speed omega, then we can say something about the, the linear velocity of, let's say, a peripheral point. So if you see from here in this direction, then you see your you know, circular uh, Excel. And yeah, here is a point, you know, we'll call it, let's say what we call it point A, and this is rotating with omega, and this is radius R1, then velocity of the point A is nothing but omega times R1, okay? Now, if you look at the wheel itself, if you look at the wheel, then what do we have for the wheel? For the wheel, we have a much larger radius. So this is, let's say, point B, that's the center point. Uh, we have much larger radius, so that's R2, and its angular velocity is also omega, okay? Now we know that this is in contact with the uh, with the ground. Even if, even if it is not in contact with the ground, it doesn't really matter. Um, we can compute the velocity of a peripheral point. Let's say that point is B over here. So velocity of the point B would be equal to R two times omega. Okay. So what what are we gaining here? Well, we we can clearly see that the velocity of the point B would be much larger compared to the velocity of the A because R2 is larger than R1, right? This is a much larger radius wheel. So VB over VA is equal to R2 over R1. Now, most of the time, we really don't compare the velocity of the point on the contact velocity of a point on the wheel versus velocity of a point on the XL um, because velocity of the, the linear velocity of a point on the XL is really not that important to us. The main point is that your XL is rotating with some angular speed and let's say this is rolling on a flat surface, then you want to have a larger linear speed for your vehicle, okay? And that you get because you choose a larger radius wheel. So the larger the radius of the wheel is, you know, faster your car or your, your you know, contraption is going to go in the forward or backward direction. So, okay, so that's good. So, but what are we losing on? So we gain on the linear speed, but what are we losing on? So if you draw a free body diagram of the Excel, where you have some force F1, let's say applied on it, okay? and um, you have the force, same force F2, well, not the same force, actually a different force F2 applied uh, on the uh, wheel. Okay, now where could these forces come from? So an easy way to think about this would be, let's say this is actually a wheel and axle for a car, and your wheel is supposed to roll on a flat surface. Okay, so in that case, if you draw a free body diagram, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have this force F2 over here. On the other hand, you will have a friction force, right? So let's say this is rotating in the counterclockwise direction, then they'll have a friction force, we'll call it F2, okay? So we know that the torque is same, the torque is same on both of them. So the torque on the input, torque on the input is F1 times R1, and the torque on the output is F2 times R2. 
right? So, and both of them are same. So, we can write F1 R1 equal to F2 R2. So, the friction force F2 over F1 is equal to R1 over R2. So, friction force F2, which is the force on the wheel from the ground, is actually now less than the input force on the XL. Now, in most of the time, we don't even talk about the input force on the XL, but the main point is that this ratio is less than 1, and this ratio is proportional to R1 over R2. So, which means that larger the R2 is, and usually you wouldn't change R1, larger the R2 is, then less is the friction force that is available to you between the wheel and the ground. Now, that means that if there was a certain amount of friction force requirement and your wheel became much, much larger, that means you wouldn't have that much friction force available to let the wheel roll without slipping. Okay, so that means that, you know, there is a limit to how much bigger you can make your wheels to be. You make them much larger, then it's very likely that your, your wheels are going to slip. So you have to pay a price for gaining on the speed in this case. So this is a scenario where we're looking at the input being the XL, this is where the input is, and the output is actually the wheel, right? Now, you can look at it in a reverse direction. So your input could be actually the wheel, and your output could be the XL. Now, where do you find something like that? Well, you find that in your car, your steering system. So your steering system is basically a large wheel, and you rotate that steering system so that you can turn your car. Now, your car weighs quite, quite a bit which means that to be able to comfortably turn your car either towards left or right or in any other direction, you have to have a lot of force magnification on the output, which is the Excel, right? And in this case, in, in case of, in the, from the perspective of steering and uh, as a wheel and Excel connected to the, uh, to the wheels of your car, uh, you have to have force advantage, right? So that's, that's, you would get that because in that case, your input is actually um, on the wheel side. So, this is your f so in this case now your f let's let me write rewrite this f1 over f2 is equal to r2 over r1 right and now you can see over here that because your r2 because your r2 is much larger than r1 right so this is the input side so 2 is now on the input side and out 2 and 1 is out on the output side so f1 is now the output this is going to be more than 1 right this is going to be more than 1 so if r2 or r1 is let's say 5 then f1 is equal to 5 times 5 times F2. So that's the force magnification of 5 to 1. Okay, so same wheel and Excel system can give you a force advantage uh, or it can give you a force reduction. Okay, and it's just a matter of perspective. So now let's look at uh, another example. So let's say I have, you know, a couple of screws. Okay, so a couple of screws, you know, we have a flat head here we have a Phillips we could also have a hex hex screw uh, and we could analyze them you know in a similar way these are also examples of actually wheel and excel even though they don't look like wheel and excel but they are so if i want to do analysis of the let's say flat headed screw and a Phillips screw what do we have so let me just focus on the top okay so i'm going to draw a free body diagram of uh, the forces that act on the flat section so yeah, this is my flat head screw top and this is my you know slot cut inside it okay and then for the phillips i have something like this okay so the question that you may have asked often while dealing with these kinds of screws is why do we use sometimes flatter screws why do we use sometimes phillips screws sometimes we use a hex nut so you know if i have to draw a hex nut you know the hex nut looks uh, uh, six-sided right six-sided screw and you have a corresponding uh, tool to actually rotate it right so what is the dif basic difference between these kinds of uh, screws um, so let's do the analysis so let's say you push your flatter screwdriver through the flatter screw and you try to rotate it so essentially what you're doing is your flatter screw uh, driver you know sits in here you know something like this okay sits in like this and if you're trying to rotate in the clockwise direction, what you're doing is you're essentially applying a force in this direction and at this edge, you're applying a force in this direction. Okay, so if I draw a free body diagram, I have, this is my slot, I have the force F that way acting and I have my force F acting that way, right? And this is, this is the point O, okay? And let's say the distance from here to here is R, okay, here to here is R, then what is the torque applied? The torque applied about point O, so let's write that, so the torque applied about point O would be F times R plus F times R, 
right? Both of them are in the same direction. So we get two F times R. That's the torque applied. Or we can write it as, as F times D, where D is basically nothing but two R, okay? D is equal to two R. That's what we get. So that's the torque applied on a flathead screw system. Now, the, the limit on the force would be determined by what kind of material this screw is made from, right? Because if you apply excessive force, then you know that this kind of force gives rise to the shear stresses on the on the screw and it will shear the, the, the screw, okay? So based on the, the, the uh, properties of the material, you would be limited as to how much force you can apply, right? And if you know that the maximum force, then you can compute what the torque would be. Now let's see what is the situation with the, with the Phillips screwdriver, okay? So with the Phillips screwdriver, you have four uh, sections, right? You have a four sections. This is what Phillips screwdriver looks like, right? And what you would have in this case is, this would be pushing it in this direction, this would be pushing in this direction, and this direction, and this direction. So essentially these edges will be pushing against the, the, the uh, slots of the screw in four different directions. So if you draw a free body diagram of this, you have, let me draw the slot again. You have force F this way, you have force F this way, you have force F this way, and you have force F this way, right? On each of these four edges, for each of these four edges. So now let's say from the center, this distance is R. Okay, this is also R, this is also R. So what do we get the torque about the center point O? So in this case, the torque is F times R, and you have four of these, so you have actually four times F times R, right? So your torque comes out to be four FR in this case, which if you write in terms of diameter would be uh, two F times D, right? That's what you would get because D is equal to, you know, two R, two R. So if you compare this torque with this torque, you can clearly see that now in the case of a Phillips screwdriver and a Phillips screw, you can apply twice the torque for the same material screw. Okay, so in a sense, what we're saying is that if you have a large torque application, so if you need, you know, to have two, two parts of uh, material uh, connected together with a large torque, you would essentially want to use a, a screw that has larger torque carrying capabilities or capacity. So in this case, it would be Phillips. So for a simple application where there's not a lot of torque needed, you might be okay using a flathead. But if you need a larger torque, then you are better off using a Phillips screwdriver. Now you can sort of continue to um, extend this for a six-sided surface. You can imagine that you will have a much larger torque capacity because you have six surfaces available, and that means your torque carrying capability could be much larger.